Hello, everyone. It's absolutely great to be back at Slash. My name is Sara Kempainen. I'm the founder in residence at 50 years. We're an early stage VC firm uh, focused on supporting entrepreneurs who are using deep tech to solve the world's biggest problems. I have the absolute pleasure to be here today with Dina, uh, Dr. Dina Radenkovic, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Gamido, a biotech startup that is utilizing advances in cell engineering to develop novel therapeutics for the diseases of the female reproductive systems. Thanks, Dina, for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Amazing. Before we jump into your very, very interesting story, Dina, I'd love to ask something from the audience. How many of you already have kids or are planning to have them in the future? Raise your hand if you are, you have kids or are planning to have them in the future. So this is certainly going to be relevant for you, but also for others. As a society, we are having kids later in, than, our, than our grandparents. But unfortunately, nature is ageist, especially against women. In the mainstream media, we often talk about um, biological clock, acknowledging that age is an important factor in the baby-making formula. Gina, putting on your medical doctor hat, could you tell us a little bit more about what's going on in our bodies, in the ovaries specifically, and why should we care about it regardless if you want to have kids or not? Yeah, absolutely. So this is an important point. Um, if you think about the process, how we make our sex cells, our gametes, it is very different if you're XX versus if you're XY. So uh, while XY men start making gametes a bit later, they can make them throughout life. If you were born like XX, what happens is that you're born with a very finite number of gametes, or eggs, essentially. And you keep losing them throughout life. <laughs> so uh, not only that you're born with like a finite number, and we may have even lost a few, unfortunately, Sarah, while waiting to come on stage, right? We got a, a, a later <laughs> slot on Friday. Um, but it's also that ovaries are an organ that ages up to five times faster than the rest of the woman's body. And what does that mean? That quite early in a woman's life, Life, you experience a relative decline in ovarian function that causes infertility. Mm -hmm. And that's where we um, get all these terms, even a geriatric pregnancy after the woman is 35, when certainly like our skin, our liver function is not geriatric, right? Like it's out of synchrony yeah. to the body. And then later on, um, you get the absolute decline in ovarian function that causes menopause. And menopause has historically been a taboo topic. Nobody kind of wanted to talk about it, but it does cause in eight out of 10 women, and very severe uh, physical, mental, and sexual health symptoms. And not only that, but the age of women experience menopause is associated with women's life expectancy. Mm. So earlier menopause is associated with shorter life. And while, when men turn on, it's usually that there is even a weaker association before your life expectancy with the age of menopause of your sister. Yeah. Um, and then after menopause, obviously I come from the aging medicine background, women experience a lot of diseases that historically we've associated with aging and frailty, right? Like weak bones and osteoporosis, loss of lean muscle mass, um, dementia, um, cardiovascular disease. So it's really important acknowledging and, uh, and addressing these um, in order to really improve a healthy life expectancy and ensure um, that we have therapies that provide us with good quality of life in this space. Absolutely, yeah. One of the surprising and shocking things I encountered when I entered this space was actually how recently we started studying female bodies. Um, it was in only 1993 when the National uh, Health Institute of Health in the United States, which is a major financing body for basic science research, mandated that clinical trials should be run both on men and women. 1993, that's 20, 28 years ago. Um, considering how little time we have studied these bodies, what are some of the unsolved problems or, uh, on the positive flip side, wide space opportunities in the, in the reproductive health space? Thank you for asking that question. I think it's very important just to let that sink in, right? Like you've said, 1993. And, um, to, to make matters worse, um, the uh, way we experience ovarian aging that causes this infertility menopause is so um, unique for humans. It's only humans and four types of whales that experience it in this yeah. way. <laughs> so not even like what we call mice, like murine models or primates um, experience in that way. So the way we test certain drugs, we have to like burn their ovaries with a chemotoxin in order to artificially induce menopause or ovarian uh, aging 
testing in order to test what, what happens. So what that means is that women were not part of trials, and then to make matters worse, we didn't have good models to study disease. Um, so obviously, diseases that affect reproductive system, the vast majority of them don't even have a first-line medication, right? Like endometriosis is a very common condition women suffer from it. It causes real suffering throughout like their reproductive and healthy years. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, again, like very little. We have like an off-label use of metformin. We, we don't have cures for these diseases that cause real suffering to half the population. Um, so I think that is an important area. And then another field, obviously, like we are trying to address it at Gamito, is that we have a cell engineering platform that we've developed in partnership with George Church's lab at Harvard Medical School, that we use this new field of cell engineering um, that Shina Yamai Naka was kind of like the early openers. He won a Nobel Prize in 2012 for this. We can take stem cells and convert them of the cells of the reproductive system. And we built the first uh, stem cell derived organoid of the reproductive system. So we can now use it to test things quicker um, in something that mimics human biology and model diseases. But there are also, I think it's important to mention here, is that even conditions that we are not directly addressing, um, like heart disease, right? Mm. Because historically, trials were done in men, the treatments we have right now work better in men. And they don't work as well in, in women for our heart disease because the way we develop heart disease is different. Mm. Um, so I think it, this really should be a call to action of inclu more inclusion of, of women um, to study our biology because we're talking about diseases that affect half the population. Absolutely. That's both sad but also fascinating. Like, there are so many white space opportunities to actually enter this field and start solving those really real issues that are not only affect women, but uh, our, our gener next generations. Exactly. Like Women account for 80% of healthcare spending, and you don't need to get that lucky to start solving, given that you're competing against pretty much nothing or a couple of available medicines. So it's a less crowded space, so you're more likely to get lucky if you do your stuff well. Absolutely. Yeah. Makes sense in business-wise. So now you're leading the charge against accelerated ovarian aging that we learned uh, just now uh, as the co-founder and CEO of Gamido. But you have a really interesting background. You were trained as a medical doctor. Um, you work in the aging field as a researcher at the Buck Institute, not far from where, you, uh, where I'm staying. You, are, you have also co-founded a longevity clinic. And you are a partner of SALT. I mean, I'm not going to even go to ask, like, how did you have time to do all of that? But longevity seems to be the through line of your career. How did you, where did that interest come from? So I, I guess, like, as a medical doctor, um, you end up realizing that a lot of the current medical care is provided at this end stage of, of, of mm. life. It's provided where most of the efforts go to late disease. Um, and I remember when I graduated, I was working in a very large, prestigious teaching hospital, um, and I, I've had patients who were just like, be like, oh, but I don't, I don't want these treatments. Like, this is not helping my quality of life, doctor. You're lovely, but like, don't take it personally. I'd rather <laughs> let's just go home yeah. and you know, spend like, my last days with my family. I, this is not really improving my quality of life. And then you realize that as a physician, you're more like a, you're not as powerful. Um, and you're more of like a consultant. You only have very little time with the patient. And at the right time, if you're optimizing for uh, the, the benefit and improvement of quality of life is much earlier. Yeah. It's while people um, are still healthy, uh, while people are still enjoying their life to the fullest, and then they will take your advice. Yeah. So I became very passionate around switching that uh, mindset in, from sick care to well care, transitioning that the brightest minds don't deal with end state disease, but with prevention, um, and removal of this dichotomy of like, you're a patient and you're not a patient, mm. right? Like we should all be improving both our physical and mental health. And I feel that like with everything that we can do with this new field of longevity or preventative medicine, will really be around improving that health span and switching care from hospitals to homes in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, everyone's a patient. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, like we can all be a better version, we yeah. all have something to improve, we are at risk of something. Um, and then I think like I really wanted to, to play a role in that new ecosystem, um, and, and I've done so both as a, as a doctor, entrepreneur, and an investor. Amazing, uh, and when did you choose, and why, more importantly, did you choose to specialize in, in reproductive longevity? 
so frankly, as many good things in medicine, they happen by accident. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and it was kind of like this. Uh, um, so obviously, like you know, you're, you, I, I built the, the, the clinics with the uh, CEO of the Buck Institute, Eric, Dr. Eric Verdin, um, and. Um, we, we started working with um, a, a research group where we were looking at like how can we certain like metabolize for like cell energy? Could we like build a medicine to make like our mice live longer? And then what ended up happening is that the mice were living like slightly longer, um, but um, the big impact was that they were dying with young ovarian follicles. Mm. And my father is actually a professor of embryology, so it was like you could fail at anything in life, but you need to know how to look at like the <laughs> histology and embryology, right? So I was just like, oh my God, this is actually true. So it hit me that ovary is a faster aging organ. It's an organ that ages up to five times faster. Um, so if you even want to study aging and test something in real time, starting from the ovary makes sense, right? Mm. Like if we wanted to, you know, test if this uh, pill is going to make us live longer, we'd have to wait until like we're 85. So, you know, it might be good for our kids, like the babies we started talking about at the start <laughs> of the session, but it's going to be a bit too late for the two of us, right? Whereas yeah. ovary ages faster, so you could see potentially uh, the, uh, gain of function even earlier, right? Like, is the 35-year-old woman having a, a better for Fertility. Um, and then another problem was that unlike aging, which is a very slow, subtle, and sophisticated process, we celebrate our birthdays, right? Yeah. And there was very little still that there was a lot around prevention of disease, and that is something we were already doing with clinics. Uh, but there was very little that like, okay, I can give you a drug and promise that this is going to increase your, your, your health span or lifespan. Whereas in the female health, suddenly you had um, a problem that Phenotypes of ovarian aging, infertility. IVF is one of the largest out-of-pocket markets, right? One in eight couples experience infertility. And the way we live, it's on the rise, right? Like, it's no longer fit for purpose. And then menopause, I mean, we're going to have one billion women living with menopause, right? And they have very little solutions. And it's no longer going to be a taboo topic. We'll scream and shout and ask for something better. Yeah, menopause so I, does not discriminate against women. <laughs> exactly. So I was just like, suddenly you have this, like, intersection of Venn diagrams almost is that you can already provide clinical benefit. Um, it is a great business, which is very important when building a venture back company. You need to ensure that if your hypothesis works, you will be able to provide returns within a certain venture fund time frame um, because these are already established businesses and infrastructure. You're not reinventing them. Um, and then something that I'm personally, as a woman who has done a medical degree in a, in a company and wants to build a huge company in this space, very very passionate about. I mean, we are mostly women company, and we all got skin in the game, and this, you know, has to work. <laughs> <laughs> we got to fix it for our poor ovaries. Um, well, Gamito is a really interesting company, uh, a large cell engineering platform, essentially, uh, developing therapeutics for the diseases of the female reproductive health. Um, but actually, you have three different programs. Could you tell us a little bit more what you're developing, and how do you prioritize between three uh, problems? Absolutely. So um, again, like starting, we started in stealth mode. Um, I founded the company with Martin Warshawski, a serial deep tech entrepreneur and the founder of largest fertility clinic chain in North America. And we really wanted to kind of build the underlying science. And that's when I jumped to be a full-time CEO. So what we've done is that um, we built from stem cells, um, we could convert them to different cells of the reproductive system, and we built that organoid platform, and we said we can now use it to derive therapeutics. And initially, um, the program is that one unit focuses on this uh, biologic that we have for egg freezing and IVF, right? Like just democratizing access to that, making it more convenient, cheaper, effective, and then using the platform to model some of these other diseases, and then finally, the biologic for menopause, right? Like, could you dissociate this? symptoms so that mm. menopause is loss of fertility, but you don't have this like, oh, I lose 80% of my hormones within one year and suddenly like my whole body is in, is in this mess. Um, and certainly we're very committed to, to solving these problems and uh, being a, a larger portfolio company, right, allows it to have multiple shots on goal where we know that biotech, even with this precision biotech, obviously has like a, a much higher uh, failure rates. Mm -hmm. um, so However, you know, even since we started a company up until now, a lot of things have, have changed in the, in the market. And um, the way we thought about sequencing it 
um, is that you focus initially on the fertility. So our almost um, the majority of uh, almost 100%, frankly, right now is focused on the Fertilo program, which is the IVF and egg freezing. And it was really for three reasons. The first one is it is a, a product that is done in vitro, right? Mm -hmm. So in a dish. So very easily we were able to, to test it and see that it works. Right. Um, that also means because it's done in a dish and not to the patient themselves, that the regulatory process is um, easier and faster. And then finally, there's that we knew that the IVF is a large market and we've already had a lot of the commercialization advantage with our relationship with clinics, right? So the idea was try to get to market quicker, try to prove your science, try to get more tangible results, and that with that, build upon being able to solve some of the bigger problems, mm -hmm. um, but with much higher clinical and execution risk. So even, you know, you could start with like, oh, there's so many things I'm passionate about with women's health, but in the end, you know, you need to ensure that you're, that you're really proving the science, that the team grows, that you've done it once, and then it's much easier to repeat. So we are actually, even though there are many things we'd, we'd like to address in the future, we're really, really focused on IVF and egg freezing, bring fertility, change that, and then move on to the next. Yes, please. You are a second time founder, so I'd love to hear, because at Slush we love hearing about like, the very tangible, hands-on advice. What's something that you learned from your first company in a hard way that you're now taking into your second one? Oof. Um, I, I would say like, it's always the worst the first time you go through an experience. I think we've had the conversation, right? So Sarah has just launched uh, Reaper Grants, uh, which is an incredible program funding research in this space. As, as she mentioned, a lot of the traditional uh, research funding doesn't go to, to women's health. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we, we shared uh, like, your experience with the entrepreneurial story. And I feel like a lot of difficulties that you experience the first time just feel like emotionally you're just like more vulnerable. And yeah. when it happens next, you're like, oh yeah, that's totally fine. I've got everything under control. And I feel like that maintaining that self-discipline and calmness in the areas of uncertainty and stress and being the person um, who is calm and who will solve problems and like calm everybody down and say like, yes, this is how we're gonna do. And being that like shock absorber, not shock amplifier and clarity. Um, I think that is something you learn certainly with experience and I am still learning it, but <laughs> I've certainly got a little bit better at it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as someone who yeah, is, is building a company, what part of the day-to-day -day company building that you enjoy the most? Uh, uh, taking a look into the inside the Gamito, yeah. I, I guess here is that this ability to combine like science with building it into products that people love. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, you know, in healthcare, like the way traditionally we brought um, new medicines to, to market has often been like, oh, there is this physician who will prescribe it and then it goes through an insurance company and then patients may not you know, even want to use this, right? Mm. Um, whereas um, what, you know, if you, now what we're seeing, I think we're seeing the consumerization of healthcare um, and we're seeing that actually, like if you address commoner conditions, you have a much larger total addressable market. So you now suddenly need to not only convince the physicians and the traditional um, body, but you also need to produce something that patients love. Mm. Um, so I think that being able to, to wear both hats is that you could go really, really deep into the science, but then you know you come and you, you, you talk to people and you see like how what you're building is, is affecting people and then you, you get that feedback back. Um, it is something that is so unique and you only really get it when when building companies and you end up like affecting like a much larger patient population than the number of patients you could see if you were just working day to day in clinical practice. Amazing, amazing. Your co-founder, Martin, has been quoted saying that sex should be for fun and uh, IVF for making babies. I'd love to know what's, what's your long-term vision for Gamido? Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he came with that saying because even the, the World Health Organization definition of infertility was around like, oh, couples who have uh, regular sexual intercourse for 12 months, but then now they're introducing, oh, but if perhaps, you know, that only is true if a woman is under 35 or this. So if you actually look at the percentages of human reproduction, it is a pretty inefficient process and much more uh, inefficient than, than other species. So he obviously, when, when he was starting Prelude, was trying to um, destigmatize uses of assisted reproduction so that people who, who need an access to infertility care um, would feel more, more likely to do so. Um, I, I think, you know, with, with Gamito, what we've seen 
um, is that like egg freezing when it started, right? Like it was initially developed for, for cancer patients. Yeah. Um, it's still, even though we now have data that egg freezing is the most effective intervention to combat age-related ovarian decline, mm -hmm. um, it is really only used, uh, in, for example, in the United States, about like 7% of IVF yeah. cycles. And the barriers are is that it's like pretty like expensive. Very right? expensive. I think um, like 30K. Yeah, like $20,000 sometimes, yeah. like at around national average. Um, and um, it is pretty inconvenient. Um, so, you know, if you're a woman and you need to get your eggs out, you end up being with like two weeks of hormonal injections. You need to have some blood tests, ultrasounds. You might experience side effects like nausea, vomiting, bloating, um, even on in rare occasions, a more severe complication called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So when it's kind of on the balance of risk and benefits, a lot of women just don't do it because of the cost and the inconvenience. Um, so one of the things that you know, we think it's really important for just optionality and a security policy is that if men make sperm throughout life, women should just get access to cheap and convenient egg freezing. And that is why we focus there on, on, on our first product. And we really hope to build like a quick, efficient egg freezing and then even see like large employers offering it and covering it because in the end it is very important for, for equitable healthcare and just as an optionality in the security policy whether it's for a, a medical condition whether if you mm -hmm. you know sometimes it happens um, whether it's for being able to do so in, in later life a lot of studies show that even uh, mothers never fulfill like the number of children they wanted to have because they just run out of time, right? Yeah. So giving that optionality to women is really important. And I really dream of a world where women would not make decisions because of this like biological clock, right? Like, oh, I, I have to do it now. Like, I'm a little bit scared. I kind of don't want to, but I may not be able to. So it's all about choice and empowerment. And I think that would be amazing if we right. were able to do it, that every woman can, can do it and have access to it because still, Assisted reproduction is not for everyone, and uh, I think we, we need to do a lot more with hopefully science and technology to allow everybody who wants to use it to, to be able to do so. Absolutely, it's not just about health, but it's also about equality and giving people the autonomy to, uh, to make those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dina, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm so thank glad you, you made it to Helsinki, um, and, and thanks everyone for coming and listening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for a great chat. <laughs>